Well, we have a returning guest today who's been here before, Dr. Stephen May, who's director, medical director of our Sullivan County Health Department. Dr. May received his undergraduate degree from ETSU and a graduate degree in medicine from UT Center for the Health Sciences in Memphis. He completed his family practice residency in Huntsville, Alabama, and has a fellowship degree in family practice. Dr. May returned to his home in Bethan and was a busy family practice for 26 years with his father. He's held many leadership positions in hospitals and public health. He's been the medical director for Sullivan County for 25 years. Dr. May currently serves as the regional medical director for Sullivan County Regional Health Department, along with assistant medical director for the Sullivan County EMS. He has been with Tennessee Emergency Preparedness, medical director for the Tennessee Department of Health, and an examiner for the Tennessee Center for Performance Excellence. He holds assistant, assistant professorships with the ETSU College of Medicine and Public Health and has received multiple community awards, including the Christian Servant Leadership Award and the Healthcare Hero Award. His diversified talents include music, aviation, wildlife management, and loving all things outdoors. He currently resides in Elizabethan with his wife of 41 years and has three children with four delightful grandchildren. Please welcome Dr. Stephen May to the podium here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, Gary Mays, our director, and believe it or not, Gary Mays is no kin to me. So <laughs> he is M A Y E S I and M A Y. He's from Hawkins County, and I'm from Carter County, so no connection. But we do work together, and we've made a great team over the last 20 or so years. Uh, but anyway, he asked me to come speak, and, and one of the uh, topics that uh, came up was what's really happening with all of our respiratory viruses this season. And there's a couple of new vaccines out that uh, I thought it'd be good for us to talk about and kind of bring those up to date for you. So uh, this is kind of what we're going to talk about. We'll, uh, focus will be on COVID-19, influenza, RSV, and then I'm going to show you some data sources and numbers for those of you who may be interested in how do we keep up with these diseases and know when we've got a problem or not. And then we'll talk a little bit about vaccines, and then I'll open it up for questions for, for y'all to ask. Of course, anytime you're welcome to Stop me and I'll be glad to try to answer them. So uh, what's circulating right now? Right now with COVID-19, it is still circulating. People are still dying from it. Worldwide, we're losing about 10,000 people a month uh, just to COVID-19. The new strain that you're going to hear about is called the JN1 strain. It is a derivative of the Omicron strain, which was... Uh, strain that really became infectious but not as deadly as the previous Delta strain. Uh, it has overtaken in the last two months, it has overtaken the previous HV1, which was at that time the predominant circulating strain. Nice thing about COVID is it's doing just what 1918 flu did a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago we had the the uh, influenza A strain that came out and was so deadly. And then over the next three to four years, it mutated, became a much milder strain. And we still deal with uh, the 1918 flu every year. And, and actually the derivative of it is in one of our vaccines, the H3N2 strain that's in your flu vaccine that you get every year is a derivative of the uh, influenza A from 100 years ago. So I think we're going to be dealing with COVID for a long time. It's showing the same pattern of mutation and change within the population. And um, so it's going to be here for a while. We still have the COVID vaccine. We'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Uh, it is also a derivative of the Omicron strain. Remember, we started out with the Alpha strain. Uh, and then we made it bivalent, added two strains, and now we switched back to a univalent vaccine, meaning one strain in it, and it's a derivative of the Omicron. It is fairly effective. Uh, it is very effective at preventing 
hospitalizations, and death. Now, we still see people get infected with it that may have been vaccinated, but we're not seeing the hospitalization and death rate. If you all remember back in uh, uh, to 2000, when all this was going on, our hospitals were running over. The nursing homes had a death rate of 20 to 30 percent, uh, and we are not seeing that anymore. Uh, a lot of that is due to the mutation of the virus, and a lot of that is also due to vaccination. We're still seeing influenza A and B. Normally, we see A come first, and then B fo follows in February and March. We are seeing both at the same time right now. And in the state of Tennessee, it, it still kills people. And we've lost two children this year in Tennessee already from influenza. So uh, vaccination uh, remains an important preventive measure that is so critical in preventing influenza A and B. It still primarily targets those who are high risk, so the elderly and the very young. Um, and uh, pregnant women are also at much higher risk to have complications from the influenza virus. So it is recognized by ACOG and all of our organizations that women uh, uh, who are pregnant should be vaccinated. Uh, in the midst of all this, we're, we, everybody's heard, how many's heard about RSV this year? Yeah, we, we got to deal with RSV post-COVID. And the reason that I think you're hearing so much more about RSV is uh, not so much because of its prominence, but because we now have a vaccine for it and we can do something about it. In prior years, we dealt with RSV, which was very deadly to our uh, infants. Uh, if an infant less than one year old got RSV, there was a high mortality rate. But now we've developed vaccines and monoclonal antibodies, complements of, of um, the research done with COVID. Uh, but we now have a monoclonal antibody we can give to infants, particularly that are high risk, to prevent them from getting RSV during our respiratory RSV season, which is now. Uh, we did have a very, very high peak in 2022 with RSV. Uh, this year, we've seen our typical spike for the winter. And I, when I show you the graphs, uh, you'll see that our numbers are, are going down some with RSV. But we, we have embarked on getting RSV vaccine out. One of the new recommendations is for those 60 years of age and older, to receive the RSV vaccine because RSV, RSV respiratory syncytial virus, is, is deadly to a lot of our elderly, particularly those in the nursing home. So we're working on vaccination campaigns to try to get those taken care of. Also post COVID, we've seen an increase in streptococcal disease, strep throat. Uh, it's gone through schools like slop through a goose right now. Everybody seems to have it. Uh, but the interesting thing with the increased rate of streptococcal infections that we've seen post-COVID, we have also seen an increase in invasive disease with streptococcus. Now, that's different from your strep throat and your strep pneumonia. This is where strep gets into the bloodstream, gets into the bones, the joints, the brain, uh, can infect the heart and cause a severe life-threatening illness and or death. And we really don't understand why this is going on. The studies are still ongoing, but we are seeing increased streptococcal disease. The nice thing about streptococcal disease is one, we can test for it. Everybody knows the quick test for your strep throat. Everybody's probably had one in here. And the other thing is it's still treatable with plain old penicillin. That's about one of the only two diseases we can still treat effectively with penicillin. But we are seeing an increased rate and increased invasive disease. And finally, pneumococcal disease. The rate hasn't changed that much. Pneumococcus is what we call the nursing home 
patient's friend. It was the one that you got your flu, two weeks later you got even sicker, developed pneumococcal pneumonia, and you subsequently died. Um, it was called the old folks' friend. But we also have vaccines for that, but there is a new vaccine that we a better vaccine that has been developed and been released. So we'll talk about that here in just a moment. So that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. And right now we're seeing all of it. It's a hodgepodge of all these diseases all rolled up into one. And we're really just now coming off our peak from Christmas, which I'll show you in some of the um, data sites we're going to go to. So let's see if this works. The first place we're going to do is we're going to try to go to the uh, what's called ResNet. Ha! Huh. Hallelujah. We have success. Uh-oh. How do I make it show up here? <coughs> Yeehaw. Okay, well, while we're working on trying to get this up on the screen, uh, ResNet is a CDC hot dog. We have success. Let's see if I can slide this down through here. There we go. Uh, the good thing is, it we are now tracking RSV, COVID, and flu through this website. So this is a one-stop, one-shop place you can go to to get your data and look at what's going on. Uh, coming on down here, uh, too far. This is surveillance by month. Uh, that you can look at for those who are information geeks like I am. Uh, but you can break it down by weekly rates, cumulative rates, seasons, uh, individual viruses. And I can go down and drill down and look at Tennessee and say, look at our Tennessee rates for about two weeks ago. It lags about two weeks on the stuff that we look at there. But this is a great place if you want to know what's going on. Now, we can only drill down to about the state level on this. On the Tennessee website, which I'll take you to here in just a minute, I can drill down to Sullivan County data that we actually feed in and look at it by week uh, on the state website. Um, let me flip you over to that. I'm not going to go into each of these uh, at this point in time because I think I'll get lost and tangled up. Suffice it to say, when we look at the graphs, our numbers are coming down since Christmas, particularly with RSV. Our COVID numbers, well, Tennessee was the highest in the nation as of two weeks ago. And guess what? Sullivan County was the highest in the state. So we were the highest really in the entire United States with our COVID rates going back two weeks ago. Um, our numbers are starting to go down. Uh, and the uh, numbers of streptococcal disease and pneumococcal disease has actually been falling too. So really over the last couple of weeks, we are seeing improvement in our numbers. Now then, this is the state one. And I want to go here. Ah, oh, yes, here we go. You can pick out your year. You can. This is week two, which is what we're going to throw up here. And here we go. This is our Tennessee Influenza Weekly Report that we look at. You can see that the laboratory confirmed for flu B is 21.5%. Flu A is 16.6%. That means we're seeing both. And that's unusual for this year. You can see Sullivan County. We can look here at our Sullivan County Metro. Let's see if I can make my little red dot work here. Hot dog. Here we go. Uh, 
looking at Sullivan County, we actually have dropped out of the critical range. We're at about 5.9%. And I always compare ourselves to the Northeast region, which is right here. They're a little bit higher than we are. I know that looking at both of those, I can tell you that what we're doing in Northeast Tennessee and looking at our numbers. Um, this website also has information. You can see our current, now this, they call it influenza-like illness, and that's where we measure the number of doctor's visits that are related to cough, cold, congestion, and, and that kind of stuff. So it's not all pure flu, but we have what's called sentinel physicians that collect specimens, sends it to our state lab, and they actually culture out what are those viruses that are growing. And so we can kind of keep up with what's circulating in the community. You can see right here, this is where we were right around, uh, I won't say that, wait a minute, I've got to look at this one again. Get my bifocals right. Yeah, our ILI rate, yeah, here we go, that's right. This was October, okay, and this was about December when everybody was sick. And you can see now we're kind of coming down and realize this is a couple of weeks behind. Here's good old Tennessee. Right there, you can see we're at the very high range. Still, the rest of the country is coming down pretty quick. But Northeast Tennessee and Tennessee are slow in coming down with their numbers. So we do have a problem here in East Tennessee. And this breaks it down looking at by strain. And remember I said we're dealing with both A and B. Here's the green bar there. That's influenza B. We typically don't see it till February or March when A is kind of dying out. But this year we've got just as much A. All this orange stuff is just to summarize as A. So we, we know that we have a high rate of influenza um, and our numbers are, though do appear to be starting to come down, but if you've got a kid that's sick with it, not quick enough. Uh, so anyway, let's go back to, I want to go, to right here. Let's go to this right here. See if it's going to work. Oh, naughty word. Make that SARS-CoV one go right there. Okay. Now, another thing that is maybe new and interesting and you may have heard about <coughs> is how many of you all have heard about wastewater sampling? Y'all heard about wastewater sampling? Well, what's really neat about doing this wastewater sampling is with just counting lab tests, we get the ones that go to the hospital and we get the ones that's done in a certified lab. But what about all the tests people are doing that are over the counter? We can't count those. So we had to figure out a way to monitor disease within the community um, and we do that now with wastewater testing. And what they can do is they sample the wastewater. We sample it twice a week. Uh, and our testing site is here in Kingsport. Well, what we can do is test now for RSV, flu, and this is the COVID-19 uh, samples. This is looking at, we were, these are the actual individual sample numbers. You can see we've got spikes up here. This is an average of the graph line that we follow. So here at the health department, we're able to follow and see what's actually circulating in the community. And it gives a relative indication of the level of disease that we're seeing in our own actual communities. Uh, I look at these every week and uh, am able to make plans based upon that 
And, and now we started out originally with just doing COVID, but now we're doing RSV and now we're doing flu. They've also done it with polio in New York City. They had a case of polio in New York City. They were able to track it down by using wastewater sampling, which community had it, and where we needed to target getting vaccines to stop a polio outbreak in New York City. And that was just done last year, I think. So this wastewater sampling has lots of implications. We can, we can, uh, we're contemplating looking at levels of uh, narcotics or illicit drugs within the wastewater. And with that, we can, at least hone it down to communities where we need to target um, uh, our public health activities in an effort to prevent it, either fentanyl deaths or drug overdoses, we, we got better. Of course, I think law enforcement probably knows where those communities are. My EMS guys knows where, knows where those communities are, but this gives us the data and helps us predict what may be happening if there's areas of high use, then we can predict and see what's going on. So this is for Sullivan County. This is tracked all across the state of Tennessee. We've got about eight different sites. We're very lucky to be on one of those sites that monitors our water, our wastewater uh, stuff that comes out. <clears throat> and like I say, if you're an information geek like I am, uh, I'm trying to get this to come up just a little bit. There, here we go. This is our COVID seven-day rolling average. And you can look here. Right here was in December. And, of course, we're a couple of weeks into the year. So this gives you an idea. We are coming off the top of our curve. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, and all the respiratory diseases are showing these same types of trends. Of course, this nice weather outside makes it even better. Okay, let's see if I can get back here now to the... That's all the data I'm going to show you. I think that's enough. I, I can wear you out with data. <laughs> there we go. Let's go to then. We can go to our next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so this brings me back to what is the core of public health. Um, how do we keep people from getting sick? What do we do in an effort to try to, what are the prevention and control measures that we want to use? Well, I'm going to go back. Um, vaccines, still our mainstay of treatment for prevention. Uh, it is the most effective way of preventing diseases uh, that we have vaccines for. Now, we learned during COVID, respiratory etiquette does work. We wiped out flu for two years. We didn't see hardly any cases of flu. This shows that hand washing, staying home, not touching your face, wearing a mask, I said the naughty word, don't, don't beat me up because I said the word mask, but they do work. They're good at prevention uh, and spreading of the disease. The other thing that we learned is appropriate sick policies. If you're sick, you need to stay home. Keep from spreading it around to everybody. And particularly, we've got to protect those who are at higher risk. Walking among us right now, I'm not going to ask, but there's always somebody on a biologic. Who, there's drugs for psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we've got all types of medicines that we use now. And of course, when you hear about them on the TV, they say increased risk of infection, increased risk of tuberculosis, increased risk of tumor enhancement. Everybody, there's a lot of people walking around on these drugs. They're great drugs, but they drop our immunity. And as such, we've got to protect those people 
from being exposed to these routine common viruses that are circulating around. And this is where I think sick policy is important in, in our work environments and even in our own personal lives. You know, you don't want to go visit grandma when you're coming down with the flu. You don't want to go to the nursing home if, if uh, you've got strep throat. That's just common sense. But sometimes in the workplace, we, we before COVID, I know we had lost. Everybody worked no matter what. But this sick policy is really important at prevention of disease to lots of other people. And there's people that you're working with that are immunocompromised. And they are at real danger, even if they've been vaccinated, because in those folks, the vaccines don't work as well. The other is we've, we've got good testing. Uh, it, up at the health department, I can test for COVID. I can test for RSV. I can do a flu test, I can do a strep test and make your diagnosis quickly. And the nice thing is we now have treatments. With COVID, we've got Paxlovid. With, uh, we've also got monoclonal antibodies that we can use. With strep, we've got our penicillin and testing that we can do. With pneumococcus, penicillin still works on the pneumococcus organism. Um, and then uh, influenza, we've got Tamiflu we can treat you with uh, and shorten the course in severity. And of course, if you're immunocompromised, we can probably save your life if we can get Tamiflu started in time before you wind up in the hospital and on a ventilator. And that does happen. So we've got the core elements. We can diagnose it now. We can treat it and we know what we can do to prevent the spread. Those are your major preventive measures that are so important in prevention of disease transmission. And this is not just for COVID, this for, is for all the respiratory viruses. Now I have not talked about the other respiratory viruses, the adenoviruses, the Coxsackie viruses, the uh, uh, rhinoviruses, uh, we do look at all those, but there's not much we can do for those other than prevention. We don't have vaccines. Um, and, and they cause your common cough, cold congestions too, just like some of these will do. So let's talk about the vaccines. I've mentioned a little bit about the COVID-19 vaccine. Let's see, how am I doing here on time? Okay. Um, the new vaccine for COVID-19 is a univalent strain, has one strain in it is what I'm saying, and uh, it is good at prevention of hospitalization and death in those who are high risk. We still see infections with COVID with those who have vac been vaccinated, but we don't see them die and wind up on a ventilator, particularly if you've got lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, or immunocompromised. Uh, flu vaccine. This year it's quadrivalent. It's got a H3N2 strain. It's got a H1N1 strain. Who remembers the uh, 2012, 11, 12? Uh, we called it avian flu vaccine that we, uh, well, we're still battling it, and it did the same thing. Uh, it was particularly rough at first on our children, is why we vaccinated our children first with the H1N1 vaccine. But it's in our vaccine, and we've got two flu B strains that are also in there. Um, looks like a good match for this year, but guess what? How many people got their flu vaccine as a population this year. I know y'all got yours, but 26% of the population was vaccinated for flu this year. Our normal numbers for vaccination is 55 to 60%. So half of our population did not get vaccinated this year. So that may explain why we're seeing a lot more flu 
this year than what we've seen in years past. The vaccine has been effective and is a pretty good match this year from, from the preliminary studies. So uh, get your flu vaccine. It's widely available, it's around, and it's not too late. And the reason I say it's not too late is you can get infected in one season with multiple strains. So you get one strain, you get over that, and then you may pick up another circulating strain. The vaccine will prevent you from getting that second or third strain if you've already had the first strain. So that's why we still say, get your flu shot. Uh, and normally we see flu A first, and then we chase it with flu B. Well, right now we're getting to wrestle with both of them. This is one of the new vaccines I want to talk about. Uh, and that's why we're talking so much about RSV now. Number one, we recognized how bad RSV was for our infants less than one year old. We now recognize that those over 60, it can also cause a severe pneumonia, put you on a ventilator, and death. The nice thing is we've come out with a new vaccine, particularly for those who are pregnant. We want to get it to them at least two weeks before the mother is mother delivers the baby so that she gives that baby immunity when it's born. So we're trying to vaccinate our women who are pregnant, particularly in the last trimester. It is not a live virus vaccine. It's based on protein F and if they've just modified it and tricked your body into go ahead and making immunity for it. Um, they've also come out with uh, over age 60. We want to try to vaccinate our elderly to prevent them from getting this and winding up in hospitals with pneumonias, ventilators, and even death. Yes. Is that going to be an annual vaccination or is that? It is right now is a one-time vaccination. One, one time, one's all you need. Pneumococcal vaccine, we've also got a new vaccine. Now, I bet it, almost everybody in here has had their pneumococcal. I, I, I think you all are almost as white-haired as I am. So, uh, you probably should have had your pneumococcal vaccines. And everybody remembers the old PPSV 23s. But we've come out with the um, uh, conjugate vaccine that's got up to 20 strains. That's what's new, is the PSV 20, or PCV 20. That's a typo on my part. PCV 20. We had the PCV 13. Prevnar, who else got children, got the pneumococcal vaccines? If the Prevnar grandchildren, hopefully they've gotten it, but we're moving from the PCV13 to the PCV20. All that means is we've added seven other strains that we can protect our children with, and it's also we're now recommending it for those over 65 to give them better immunity associated with the old PPSV23. And, and so those are our new vaccines, RSV and this PSPCV20. Let's see if I make this go. So uh, I just threw these up here. Uh, these are just the recommendations from the CDC. I've already talked about adult age 60s, get a single dose, shared clinical decision making. Infants and young children, this is critical. Every year we lose a number of children to RSV and now it is preventable. If we can get it into our pregnant women before they birth or after they're born, we get them vaccinated with uh, um, the vaccine. Uh, there's the pregnant people and of course I mentioned in infants and young children. Now this right here is a monoclonal antibody it's actually giving them the antibody to keep them from ever getting sick with it for their first year of life. And then we want to go to the other vaccine that we can give them uh, up into their second year. But this is the ones we're trying to protect. Children less than two years old uh, that do not need to get this disease anymore. So that, that's kind of it. That's the new stuff. That's what's going on. That's what's circulating around. And this is what we're trying to do about it to, to change the outcomes that we see. I'll, I'll open it up now to questions. And